Shabbat Shalom, everybody. So I want to start with a headline. It's a February 21st headline from the London-based Jewish Chronicle. Young Jews worldwide feel new sense of identity after October 7th. The article is about an uptick in interest in Jewish education and Jewish universities, including Yeshiva University in New York, which now has a 30% increase in student registration for next fall. Another headline from a January 19th article in the Times of Israel. North American Jewish schools see dramatic enrollment upturn after October 7th. There it discusses a study by Prisma, the Jewish Day School Network Center, showing that interest in Jewish Day School is up over 35% from last year at this time. It also notes that over 1,100 Israeli Americans have enrolled children in Jewish Day Schools just since October 7th. Not an insignificant number. As to why the increase in Jewish educational interest that parents want their kids in a Jewish environment is for two reasons. One, the majority fear of anti-Semitism. And two, discomfort with their child's current school's response to Israel's war with Hamas. Of course, all of this falls within the context of the Anti-Defamation League's report. There's been a 388% increase in anti-Semitic incidents since last year alone in the United States. Anecdotally, Chaviv Retegur, the senior political analyst from the Times of Israel, was recently on a tour of Ivy League college campuses giving talks. Of course, he was protested at each one, and he said that his audiences were almost all Jewish students, and that the Jewish students he talked to were becoming more Zionist as a result of the campus protests, not less. Like the two headlines I mentioned, these young Jews are becoming more interested in Judaism. Their Zionist position is more reinforced since October 7th. And I want to understand why. Why that is. And what does that mean for the future? Of course, I wonder how things would have looked if the world responded differently to October 7th. Consider the following counterfactual. I love counterfactuals. Rabbis love counterfactuals. Imagine a world on October 8th and after where the United Nations came out adamantly and without equivocation condemning the attack by Hamas on Israel as brutal and sadistic terrorism, quickly putting a resolution on the floor to support Israel. Then imagine that celebrities came out with a series of PSAs on social media saying, bring them home posting pictures of the hostages. Imagine if social justice-minded college students and young people put up posters of the hostages, calling for the end of terrorism to believe Israeli women who were systematically raped and to oppose violent jihadi theocracy of Hamas. But that's not what we got. We got the reverse of that. A December uh, Harvard-Harris poll showed that over two-thirds of 18 to 24-year-olds, that's Gen Z, not only support Hamas, but also claim that Jews should be seen and treated as an oppressor class. About 40% of 25 to 44-year-olds, that's millennials, believe the same thing. What I'm saying is that in our world, there has been less empathy for Israel and Jews since the October 7th pogrom. And it's not because of Israel's response and the high Palestinian death toll in Gaza. And it's not because Israel has been occupying Gaza, because it hasn't since 2005. Hamas has been running Gaza for nearly 20 years. It's none of that. Because the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic protests began on October 7th itself, literally while the intimate brutality was still happening. And that's not to say that the pictures coming out of Gaza in the months after October 7th haven't been horrific. Anyone with a heart has to be disturbed. But as callous as it may sound, what we see coming out of Gaza is largely what Hamas wants you to see. 
wants the Western world in particular to see. Mati Friedman, the great Israeli journalist who worked for the Associated Press and subsequently left mainstream media because of what he saw as journalism sliding into quote, ideological messaging rather than simply reporting what's going on, said the following in a February interview. The AP, that's the Associated Press, like the rest of the Western press, plays ball with Hamas. You'll almost never see videos or photos of a rocket launch from a civilian area. There's a reason for that. I spoke to a TV cameraman who covered the 2014 war, and they told me that they would stand at the entrance to the Shifa hospital, which is where the casualties come from. It's the biggest hospital in Gaza, and they were allowed to film civilian casualties coming in. But when Hamas casualties came in, there was a Hamas minder at the door to the hospital, and he would signal, and he would signal to them to turn off their cameras, and they would. So Hamas became very adept at presenting the image of a war that wasn't really a war. It was just Israeli violence directed at Palestinian civilians. Hamas just made itself disappear. So you just don't see Hamas. And they've done it again, I think, with some success. I mean, the Gaza Health Ministry, which is Hamas, will release casualty figures that don't differentiate between civilians and Hamas fighters. And that's to give you the impression that the civilian death toll is extremely high. And the Western reporters play along with it. So part of it is censorship. All of the Western press in Gaza at the moment is done by Palestinians who are from Gaza and who live under Hamas control. That means that these people cannot cross Hamas. I'm not saying anything about their integrity. I'm just saying that if you live under Hamas rule, you do what Hamas says because the consequences for you can be very severe. The Western press thus is limited. And we were told at the AP that we couldn't report certain things because it would put our staff in Gaza at risk. And that's all we see on CNN, the New York Times, and throughout Western media. We don't get the whole picture. And along those lines, my question since the start of it has been, how are the Hamas tunnels, which stretch about 350 miles, literally blanking Hamas with Palestinian cities and civilians, particularly hospitals and schools, how is that not the biggest story in the world? This is a war crime, a crime against humanity to the Palestinians. How is this acceptable in the world's eyes? Is the world really going to allow this precedent, this criminal tactic of barbarism, hostages, tunneling, and human shields win? That's the tactic. I don't get it. And still, despite the wave of biased reporting, despite the TikTok algorithm, this is real, leading young people down a Jew hate wormhole, and by the way, American hate wormhole, despite all that, plus small pockets of so-called Jewish anti-Zionists, why has there been this increase in this sense of Jewish and Zionist identification among so many Jews? Why the push to more Jewish education? Well, I suggest it's because it doesn't add up. And common sense has a way of catching up. The inherent anti-Semitism in the unfolding story is just too obvious. Natan Sharansky wrote a 2004 article identifying the 3D litmus test for anti-Semitism, delegitimizing, dehumanizing, and double standards. What is delegitimizing? When you say that Israelis, and by extension Jews, are Zionist colonialists that have no historical claim to the land of Israel, that's not only a falsehood, but it's also a blatant attempt at delegitimization. When Palestinians themselves are asked by reporters where Jews come from, they name countries in Europe, North America. In other words, Palestinians, due to their education system, don't even know that Jews have a claim to the land of Israel. 
But it's not just Palestinians. It's Europeans, other Arabs, Americans who are saying the Jews should go back to where they came from. Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO, while at the Camp David Accords in 2000, literally said to Bill Clinton, quote, Solomon's temple was not in Jerusalem, but Nablus. <laughs> Mahmoud Abbas, the current head of Fatah, said the Jews have no historical ties to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That's the party line, everybody. So if you delegitimize the facts on the ground, like literally the ancient stones in the ground, and they have trashed and burned ancient artifacts as a part of that effort, then the chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, makes sense. It makes sense because they want to be free from Jews who they see as the invaders of their land. Yes, it rings of Jewish genocide, but it doesn't necessarily have to be interpreted as genocide if you've delegitimized the Jewish claim to the land. That's delegitimization. And that's also what's at stake with this war. Demonization. America and the West has done such a good job at exposing the sins of our own historical past. What happened to the Native Americans is awful, heartbreaking. Slavery and racism, unquestionably terrible. What has happened to other suppressed groups, women, the LGBTQ community, and on and on. And I'm so glad that many of the policies and systems and individuals responsible for that oppressive social environment are gone. The issues are not entirely gone. Maybe they never will be, but it's so much better than it was. Yet many are still vigilant at, expose, at about exposing oppression, almost treating as, it as if it hasn't really improved. And that vigilance can get very reductive. And on the most reductive level in the formula who has been the most oppressive, the worst thing you can be is white and rich. So on the simplest level, the takeaway is that white rich people are the primary oppressors. And the most representative of white and rich in today's world, believe it or not, the epitome of white and rich has become Jews and Israelis. Again, not true, but if your worldview is a simplistic binary narrative of oppressors versus the oppressed, when you look at Israel and American Jews, it's much easier to weave us into the oppressor category than the oppressed. And moreover, we're not just in the category of oppressors, we're the quintessence of it. And that formula points directly at Zionists, which is basically a stand-in word for Jews. As not just bad guys in the stories, in the story, but the German Nazis of our time, the European imperialists, and American white supremacists, all wrapped up into one. So it makes sense that people tore down posters of hostages. It makes sense that they denied Jewish-Israeli women were being systematically raped and abused because it's intolerable to their binary narrative. It doesn't fit their morally cartoonish conception of Israel. So they deny it. And if it's not denied, it's excused. Because after all, what do you expect? They're fighting Nazis and imperialists and white supremacists. They get some moral leniency, a pardon, if you will. And that answers the question why the world is okay with the tunnels and human shields. It's just part of the cause for liberation by any means necessary. And so we see Cornell professor of history, Russell Rickford, publicly declare about October 7th massacre, it was exhilarating and energizing to see. That's demonization. And so, by natural extension, we hear accusations of apartheid and genocide. Really? Ask Israeli Arabs if there's apartheid or genocide in Israel. Lucy Arish, an Israeli Arab, 
who's the anchor for Channel 13 News in Israel, was recently asked this question by Barry Weiss, another journalist who left the mainstream media, media for the same reason Maddie Friedman did. Here's what she said. Apartheid? No, look at me. I'm a presenter on a mainstream TV channel in Israel. My sister is working in one of the big banks in Israel. My other sister is the general manager of a big hotel in Elat. This is not an apartheid country, but there is a lot of racism toward Arabs. Every country is dealing with racism, and racism should be fought, and I'm going to fight it. Then she goes on to talk about how Israel needs to be Jewish and democratic. For me, this state, it's a natural thing that it'll be Jewish and democratic. If you want to call me the gatekeeper of the Israeli democracy and the Jewish people, I have no problem with that. I'm the gatekeeper. I'm going to be the person that is going to remind a lot of Jewish people that it was not so long ago that the state of Israel didn't exist and the Jewish people almost didn't exist. That's an Israeli Arab talking. And she's no minority. In fact, the majority of Israeli Arabs have become closer to Israel and Israelis as a result of October 7th. The majority of nearly 80% have volunteered as civilians in the war effort. So apartheid? No. Genocide? Absurd. But the terms Nazi, white supremacist, apartheid, genocide, that's all part of the demonization effort. The last and third D, double standards. Let's just start with populations as there are about 331 million people in the United States, and there are just over 9 million people living in Israel. I did the math, and per capita. On October 7th, if the same number were massacred in the United States, a conservative estimate is that it would be the equivalent of over 35,000 Americans being hideously murdered. The 240 hostages would be the equivalent of 5,000 American hostages. The over 200,000 Israelis displaced from, displaced from their homes, over 5 million Americans displaced. Another counterfactual. Can you imagine if the Mexican cartel raided Arizona or Texas or San Diego and barbarically massacred 35,000 Americans then went into, I don't know, let's say San Diego State and kidnapped a freshman class of over 5,000 and over 5 million Americans were then displaced from their homes. Just imagine that. Just feel into that for a second. You'd know someone or would know someone who knows someone who was directly affected and hit by this. And what do you think the United States would do? What would Americans, what would you want the U.S. to do? My guess is that a different standard would apply than what many apply to Israel. The list of double standards against the sole Jewish state in the world is simply too long and too irritating to enumerate. All I'll say is just Google U.N. resolutions against Israel versus every other country in the world. And so for many Jews, the numbers don't add up. We see the game of the three Ds, delegitimizing, demonizing, and double standards, and it has made us feel more Jewish, more connected to Israel, and wanting to connect more to our Jewish brothers and sisters because we see the moral confusion in the world. We see how deep it runs and for how long this has been brewing, and it's lonely and scary. So we need our people to hold and for them to hold us. And we should also be sympathetic and compassionate to the innocent Palestinians and the need for humanitarian aid. And Israel should do everything it can and show the world it is doing everything it can to prevent Gaza civilians from starving. And so maybe you see the reports about Gaza in the West and are asking yourself, maybe it's enough already. Israel should just call a ceasefire. 
Plus, it's, it's having a really bad effect on our domestic politics. But you have to know that the vast majority of Israelis want this war. Not just, they want to win the war. Not just fight to a truce. And it's not about Netanyahu and his right-wing cabinet. Most Israelis can't stand Netanyahu because he so often seems to put his own political interests ahead of what's best for Israel. And I pray he not bungle Israel's relationship with the U.S. over his personal political gain. But this is not Netanyahu's war, as, been, as has been said by prominent American politicians. It's the Israeli people themselves. And I'll tell you why they feel this way. Through the words of Anat Wilf. Anat Wilf is a former Israeli intelligence officer, a member of the Knesset from the liberal Labor Party. She got her BA from Harvard and PhD in political science from the University of Cambridge, written several books. She recounts in an interview, I grew up in Jerusalem in a very classic Labor Party neighborhood. Everyone around us voted for labor. And then, as I became an adult, the Labor Party at that point was transitioning from socialism to being the party of peace, focused precisely on this equation of land for peace. And it was a very compelling idea, because the idea that was there, that idea was that there is a path to peace for Israel, and it's very simple. <coughs> All that Israel has to do is hand over lands acquired as a result of the 1967 Six-Day War, and there will be peace. And it was like euphoric in the 90s. It was a decade of the end of history, <clears throat> of euphoria. We're putting all these old issues behind us. Not only have we made peace with Egypt based on this formula, we were now negotiating with Syria over the Golan Heights. And we signed to the West Bank, we signed another peace agreement with Jordan when Jordan gave up its territorial claim to the West Bank. And then we negotiated directly with the Palestinian Liberation Organization over the future of the West Bank and Gaza. And like many Israelis, I followed with so much excitement and joy. When Ehud Barak goes to Camp David, he puts this proposal on the table. <clears throat> People forget by now how audacious and far-reaching it was for the Palestinians to have a fully sovereign state in the West Bank in Gaza, the end of occupation, and the Israeli military retreats. There were going to be no settlements in that state. The capital was going to be in Jerusalem, including holy sites in East Jerusalem. It was essentially check, check, check. All that the Palestinians had to do was say yes. And Arafat walks away. And not only does he walk away, he walks away to no criticism from his people. That's not even a, there's not even a single Palestinian writing an op-ed in a British newspaper saying, are you nuts? Go back to the negotiating room and get us the state for which we've been fighting, that we've been longing for for so long. And what follows is what's known as the second intifada, but really was this massive campaign of violence that before October 7th was the darkest time to live in Israel. She continues. That's the moment when I began to ask a very simple question. What do the Palestinians want? Because they clearly don't want an independent state. They clearly don't care about the settlements. They clearly don't care about a capital in East Jerusalem because they could have had just, they could have just had all of it. And they walked away from it. And I realized that we have to credit the Palestinians. They always told us what they wanted. We just didn't listen. We didn't take it seriously because it sounded too crazy. But they always told us, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Free of what? Free of the Jewish state. Free of sovereign Jews. They were consistent. They were clear. And now we also had the empirical evidence. At the critical moment, they could have had their state. But it would have meant legitimizing the Jewish state. Understanding they're going to live next to a Jewish state rather than instead of it. So they walked away and they followed up with violence and it became clear that the entire conflict is not about land. I bring that because what A. Not Wilf said 
is now representative of most Israelis. They know their neighbors better than anyone. And October 7th has sobered them further. And so the majority of Israelis, and I'm talking over 80% at this point, don't believe in the possibility of a Palestinian state alongside Israel because they don't trust that such a peace will be critical, credible with the Palestinian leadership and system as they are now. And they want the hostages back. And they don't want Hamas back in power in Gaza. But that very same majority of over 80% 80 of Israelis is also absolutely ready to work toward a two-state solution with a transformed Palestinian people. Not with the current minority of Palestinians. Polls shift on this, but it's basically historically been around 15%. That minority who are open to a partnership to settle mutual goals toward a two-state solution with Israel. Israelis are willing to work with a transformed majority of Palestinians who want peace with Jews and Israelis without the delegitimization, demonization, and double standards. And therefore, there's still hope. So with all I've said, why are Jews turning inward to Jewish environments and more Jewish education? Well, let me put it to you this way. Is it possible that Israel is right on this and the world is wrong? Yep, you bet it is possible. And Jews around the world are seeing it. They see the three Ds of anti-Semitism playing out. And many want to be and want their kids to be in Jewish environments where they're safe. And also, perhaps on a deeper level, now more than ever, Jews want to know who they are gain a sense of their Jewish purpose, the meaning of being Jewish. They know it's meaningful and important, but they don't totally know what that involves. Israelis are also awakening to what being Jewish involves in this new reality. And I believe that what we want, each and every Jew, Israeli and diasporic, is religion. And when I say religion, I'm not talking about faith and ritual observance. I'm talking about the root of the word religion, lig, like ligament, to be connected. We want connection and rootedness. And Judaism roots us so deeply, so profoundly, because it frames our connection in many things at once and therefore demands a lot of attention because it's about our people, it's about our land, it's about our tradition and rituals, it's about our language, it's about our ancestors and teachers, it's about our faith, our emona, and uh, as well as our doubts. It's both mystical and down-to-earth practical. Judaism as a religion is a way of being in the world. It's how we think and question. It's how we serve a purpose greater than ourselves. It's about the values we instill in our children. It's about our shared history and our shared destiny. And now it's about the greatest collective project of our people, maybe ever, which is the state of Israel. And all of that is what gives us hope and the resilience to live another day, to survive another generation. And that resiliency is the cornerstone, it's the foundation, that's Jewish spirit, resiliency. And that is where I believe God is in the story. God is in our resilience and in our creativity. But for it to work, you gotta appreciate it. And the only way you're gonna appreciate it is if you know something about it, you have to learn. We can't take any of it for granted in this new reality. Because, and I'm sorry to be the one to say this to you, but the haters are just waiting for an opening. They're waiting for us to forget what we've survived for. Waiting for us to lose our sense of purpose. Because when you lose your sense of purpose, your resiliency goes with it. Jean-Paul Sartre, the French, French existentialist, wrote in his 1946 book, Reflections on the Jewish Question. That it is the anti-Semite that makes the Jew. Get that? The anti-Semite 
makes the Jew. And I have resisted that idea and really don't want that to be true because I want a more positive reason to be Jewish. But I'm feeling more and more of something else he said in that book, which is that if the Jew did not exist, the anti-Semite would invent him. That's what I'm feeling these days. That in many ways, so many groups are projecting their boogeyman onto us right now and calling him Zionist and Jew. So what do we do? Well, I'll say what I've been saying. Go to Shul. And I'm not talking about on Shabbat alone. Send your kids to Beit Bina, the Hebrew school, the Tins Tichon. Make it a priority. I know they got a jillion things to do. Make being Jewish a priority. Learn Jewish history and world history. We have to learn how the world works and how Jews fit into it. And teach about and talk about anti-Semitism. We can't be shy about this anymore. Speak up. What does Mordechai say? Perhaps for this reason you were put in this place of royalty. To speak up. Where are the Jewish CEOs? Where are the Jewish university presidents? Where are the Jewish tech leaders? Jewish titans in finance and industry? If Jews are running Hollywood, they sure ain't showing it now. We need to speak up. And my fear is, as this may be my fear, that maybe it's just my fear, is that they're not speaking up, not because they're merely afraid, but that they're afraid because they're not confidently informed and educated. They don't know their Jewish history and don't feel equipped to refute what they're hearing. I'll end with a quote from Paul Bernstein, the CEO of Prisma, the Jewish Day School Network, from the Times of Israel article that I started with. The best thing we can possibly do to fight anti-Semitism is to empower, educate, and embrace our community and give our children the best Jewish education that we possibly can. Personally, I agree. The antidote to anti-Semitism, the antidote to Haman, if you will, is keeping our people connected, staying together and unified, and Jewish education is the critical key to the endeavor of this connection, empowerment, and community. Maybe that seems simple. Just, just so simple. But it's challenging. You've got to prioritize it. You've got to show up. And I hope and pray we're up for the challenge. And if the story of Purim, of the bravery and ingenuity of Esther and Mordechai teaches us anything, is that we've been up for this challenge before and we can be again. I hope and pray we have a very joyful, meaningful Purim starting tonight and tomorrow. And I wish you all Shabbat Shalom.